Hey, what's up, everybody? Good morning. This is OC. We are doing live coverage of the inauguration. There is ex-president George W. Bush. You can see others arriving. So we're going to keep it here and keep you going live on the inauguration. He should be getting sworn in in about 30 minutes. So uh, sit back and uh, enjoy the show. Should be pretty entertaining. Admittedly, there are some who are not on board with that plan. More than 60 House Democrats have said they plan to skip today's ceremony. But the woman who lost the election, as I mentioned, to Donald Trump, did show up, and there she is, waving. Hillary Clinton there with her husband, the former president, Bill Clinton, on her right. In fact, every living former president is in attendance, with the exception, exception of George H.W. Bush, who has pneumonia is in, and is in the hospital in Texas. The former presidents will be on a special inauguration platform built from scratch to hold more than 1,600 people. Joining them, guests including members of Congress, justices of the Supreme cabinet members, and the nominee. All will watch closely as less than one hour from now, President-elect Donald Trump is scheduled to take the oath of office. It's part of a tradition that began with our nation's birth and continues to this day. Donald Trump is to place his hand upon two Bibles, one given to him by his mother, and the other that belonged to Abraham Lincoln. Then the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, John Roberts, will administer the oath, asking Donald Trump to swear that he will preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. And with those words, at the stroke of noon or thereabout, Donald Trump will become the Commander-in-Chief of the United States military and the leader of the free world. Michelle Obama uh, kissing friends and uh, loved ones around the White House goodbye. We watched as they uh, had their final stay, really, this morning in the White House. And we'll talk and show you what this entails, the moving out of one and the moving in of another. But certainly, coming in to, to lead this nation, a very heady position, even for a billionaire reality star. In the hours to come, we'll watch it all with you. We will hear how workers move one family in and one family out of the White House in an intricately coordinated dance that unfolds in just a matter of hours. We'll show you the security, the tens of thousands of officers and agents dedicated to protecting the spectators, the protesters alike. And we'll listen to Donald Trump's first words as our president for the first signals about what sort of leader he'll be. And we will consider the issues he faces and those he has promised to fix, from immigration and terrorism to health care and American jobs. As we hear the nation bear witness to the inauguration of Donald Trump. Of course, we'll hear from many extraordinary guests throughout this morning and into the early afternoon here on the East Coast. And with us throughout, A.B. Stoddard, associate editor of RealClearPolitics.com, John Bussey, associate editor of The Wall Street Journal, our corporate cousins at Fox, and next to him, Julie Bikowitz, a national political reporter for the Associated Press. And there he comes, the former pre or the current president and the president-elect. Listen. <laughs> Maybe right. Stoddard, for all that has ma been made of the stark differences between this incoming president and one's past, between this transition team and one's past, between this cabinet and one's past, this morning has been historically pretty much by the book. Yeah, and I think that um, Barack Obama has struggled during this transition with a few, you know, unexpected things like this intelligence on Russian hacking and things he's had to address, which makes it tense and awkward, but by and large has sent a message since November 9th to Americans that everyone would, will want Donald Trump to succeed as he does, because that means America succeeds, and that he wants to help him in every way possible, and is diametrically opposite as they are. He's really made, put some energy into trying to keep Donald Trump on the phone and build a relationship of trust that will last beyond this day in, into Donald Trump's presidency. And here comes the first family to be. Let's listen. Bussy, there are a few within the Trump team, include those 
who would uh, pretend to you that they actually thought they would be here at some point. They did not. It has been an extraordinary journey. Yeah, you know, it really has. Um, and the journey's uh, in many ways just beginning. We're going to hear today in his inaugural address probably some of what he wants to do. We're going to be watching very closely to see what he does today. He said on his first day he's going to take a number of executive orders. We'll, we'll wait to see whether that or whether he decides to uh, wait another day, let the uh, and get some ducks in order before uh, making some of the moves that he planned to make. But in the meantime, I mean, the words we've heard over the last few days about this being you know, a, a civic sacrament, uh, a term also associated with just the power of the vote uh, in the United States, really is true. I mean, this is a critical part of American democracy, democracy's big day, as it's been referred to, uh, in which the, the peaceful transfer of power happens in the United States in a in a way that's that's uh, not common around the world. Julie Bikowitz scripted uh, to the T, and yet this is not a man who is one to remain on script. I, I, for one, look forward to that inaugural address, I think, oh. in a way I may never have before. Absolutely, absolutely. And the fact is we just don't know how he's going to govern. That's uh, his opponents and his supporters alike. You know, we're waiting to see how he is as president. Throughout the transition, he really held on to some of the same core characteristics that he had throughout the campaign, but there's just something about the gravity of the office that you just don't know how someone will react to it. They're announcing the first family, Eric Trump and his family. And the House of Representatives Chief Administrative Officer, Philip G. Kiko. with the weather today. The weatherman had called for rain pretty much throughout this ceremony, beginning at about 7 o'clock this morning. It did drizzle for a minute or so, but but the skies are opening up a little bit now. It doesn't look like rain is imminent at all. Uh, if anything, we're expecting a few showers. And the temperature for the people who are up on the, the dais today, I, I just can't imagine how it could be better. On this day, January 21st in 1985, as Ronald Reagan was sworn in at high noon, it was 7 degrees. That's Fahrenheit in your nation's capital. Uh, it was very cold for for uh, Barack Obama's first inauguration uh, eight years ago. It, it, as memory serves, it was about 27 degrees at, at this time of day, and it was quite miserable. Today, it'll be high 40s. There's just barely a wind to fall, maybe five miles an hour, and just a perfect day for photographs with the overcast skies. It'll make all the pictures beautiful, uh, and the first family, uh, first family to be. First family in an hour, smiling ear to ear uh, as we wait for the, the next round of things. Everything's pretty tightly scripted, A.B. They're not, they're not uh, hell-bent on noon swearing in, but round about noon, uh, we'll hear that. Right. Uh, you know, you, there can be delays with getting some people in, out onto the stands, and um, you account for that. But it'll, be, it'll happen around, um, around on time, and Donald Trump has pledged that his remarks are going to be brief. He wants to do it in 20 minutes. About Richard Nixon said that um, the best ones, the ones, the shortest ones, and so um, I think he he knows that uh, he wants to keep people's attention and move on with the festivities. That Donald Trump is not one to want to sit through the long lunch in Congress, although he will do it. Uh, I think he wants to get right to work. Um, and you're right, this is really um, quite a blessing. He predicted that the sun would shine for him. It might not, but he's very lucky that. They're not under pouring rain because it does make a difference to the people, the dignitaries in the audience and people um, for whom it's more difficult to move around. So it's, it's good for everybody that the weather is cooperating. Don't let them tell you there's nobody here. The crowds are not what they were eight years ago, of course. They may not even be the 800,000 that we had four years ago, but the rain may have kept some people away. I will tell you this, in the hotel where we're staying, people are up and about at 4 a.m. Yeah. This I'm 100% sure, uh, and the revelry began at that time celebrations in and around the streets. We saw a small group of maybe 20 protesters on the way over here, but all of this talk of protesting on every street has not happened uh, uh, throughout the district and certainly in other cities around the country. But largely what we've seen, huge group of Make America Great hats 
and people from the four corners of this country, uh, everyone I've seen is excited and smiling and just really thrilled to be a part of this process. It doesn't matter where you are politically. I assure you, once you get here on this day and feel the power of this event, it, it really is, you feel sort of awestruck, really. Well, you just noticed it was such an American moment, the nation's first American president meeting Donald J. Trump, a celebrity businessman with no military or political experience who's about to take office. I mean, only in America, right? It's certainly, John. I, I'm not sure anybody thought we'd ever get here, but here we are. Yeah. And, you know, protests are uh, part of the course with uh, inaugurations. You had them during uh, Woodrow Wilson's days uh, over the, the suffragette movement was very active in the streets then. Uh, Nixon uh, over Vietnam, uh, Bush over Iraq. Abraham Lincoln was so concerned about security and the security forces were so concerned about his security coming in as a abolitionist in his first term. He came in the night before in disguise to avoid confrontation in the street. So it's a very democratic thing to have protests. And we'll see tomorrow whether or not the protests, the, the Homeland Security is expecting some of the, they said they could get up to 400,000. That seems, sounds like a very large number to me tomorrow. Um, We'll see tomorrow what the what the uh, what the real demonstrations uh, unfold and how big they are. Twelve years of George W. Bush, there was there was a bit of a skirmish just a few blocks from where we are right now. Some pepper spray in the early morning call times that day because of security were very early before the sunrise. People were out and restless, and I, I haven't experienced that today. Yeah. Of, of all the talk of it, Julie, and this is this is a come together at least for now. It seems that way. I mean, certainly some of the, the same sorts of parties and receptions that you would expect for any inauguration sure. happening, and, and largely without any problems at all. Smaller in number each year. The, the district, every four years, the district on this, the night, this night, they allow for the bars to stay open later. Eight years ago for Barack Obama's, there were 290 licenses given for that. Then a fewer number, like 160 four years ago. This year, 109. That is not to say people are not out and about. I saw them last night. They are. Uh, the, the celebration is on. It'll go late in the evening. There are three sponsored balls today, three official balls this evening, two of them in one location, one in another. But there are lots of parties all over town. Again, the number is not as, as high as there have been in the past. But I'll tell you this. The day after the election, 90% of the hotel rooms that were booked were canceled. And a whole new group came in, the Hillary Clinton uh, fans. Uh, canceled their reservations and made room for these. Airbnb reservations in the district usually average about $150, $200 a room. They're going for about $1,000 a night. So if you were coming here, you needed to have a wheelbarrow full of money next to your Make America Great hat. Ed Rollins is sporting both. He's with us. He was a top strategist for the Great America Super PAC, which supported Donald Trump. He was also Ronald Reagan's political director and his national campaign director for the 1984 election, winning 49 of 50 states. He's one of the best uh, sort of feelers of the mood I've ever known in this business. And yet, uh, on an early night in November, I remember him saying, it's impossible. And Ed, like everyone else, we were wrong. Well, fortunately, we were wrong. I'm very happy for the outcome, obviously. And, and I think I think to a certain extent, we're going to have a very fascinating uh, term here. It's going to get started quick. Administration, where you see very quickly, a lot of people want to serve, a lot of people want to make change in this, this country. What should we expect from his, his speech today, his inaugural speech? I think it'll be shorter than the, the speeches he's given out on the trail, which is important because it's a big audience, obviously. I made it. I'm not going to have the fall moment. Uh, Rick Perry, the, the former governor of Texas, with a salute there, who infamously said he, did, he wanted to dismantle the energy department, uh, but forgot that that's what he wanted to dismantle. He called it his oops moment. Uh, and anybody who says you cannot get back up after spectacular, world-renowned failure uh, should witness Rick Perry, who is coming into this administration as energy secretary, secretary of the very department that he wanted to eliminate. Of course, there's Bernie Sanders. All the Bernie bros are in and around town. Bernie Sanders has been on a tour out and about <coughs> with Democratic lawmakers, uh, the different state capitals holding rallies over the past days, John, John Cornyn. Now the introduction of the First Lady. And the wife of the Vice President, Dr. Jill Biden. Escorted by the Democratic Staff Director of the United States Senate Committee on Rules and Administration, Kelly Fado, Ms. Irish Weinshall, and Mr. Paul Pelosi. The woman with 
arguably, the, not arguably, definitely the highest approval rating in all of Washington. She can run for just about anything tomorrow, I, I, I think, Julian Winner. She gave spectacular speeches throughout the campaign. I, I think that was a big surprise in some ways, just because she hasn't been out there quite as much um, and, and isn't really a huge fan of politics. That's well known. Clearly. But she, boy, can she deliver a speech. Uh, the, the former first lady, the current first lady, uh, shaking hands. They, the, the current first lady worked mighty hard for Hillary Clinton, uh, especially in the, in, the, in the later days of that campaign. They, they, they poured their political soul out, and uh, the, the popularity of Barack and Michelle Obama did not translate. Yeah, it, 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 and in the, actually in the weeks and months since uh, President Obama has really not so subtly, implicitly criticized Hillary Clinton's campaign for not going to the right places, um, and you can hear it when he says, when he talks about how he, he wished his popularity had, had translated not only in those midterm elections, but in this election. And, and it's true, they fought very hard for her, and in the end, um, it's, it was really hard to create an enthusiasm for a candidate who really had so little um, and had so many sort of liabilities, political liabilities, ethical liabilities, um, and, uh, but they did it. And, and every time you heard Michelle Obama out there for Hillary, it, it sounded so earnest and so genuine, uh, even though they, didn't, they weren't always close. Um, I thought one of the great moments of today was just a few minutes ago seeing Hillary Clinton doing her quiet talk in the in the ear of George W. Bush. I wonder what that was about. And to see uh, President Carter there, man, he looks terrific, standing up straight, walking. Cancer-free. Yeah, completely cancer-free and an inspiration to so many cancer survivors and cancer patients across the across the nation, Rosalind Carter there with him, and, and they walked with a quick gait and looked totally into it. Yeah, and that's still so active, uh, you know, in civic uh, duties around the country and all of the various things he does. You know, I think it's important to note also that you have a president and a first lady going out uh, at very high popularity uh, poll. Rates. At the same time, you have a president coming in with the greatest disapproval ratings uh, in a generation. Uh, that difficulty now of overcoming that, uh, he starts with the speech, I think, in framing his next administration. Melania Trump and uh, Carolyn Pence, uh, Melania, Karen Pence, I meant to say, excuse me, man, Melania Trump compared, I've been watching television all morning like the rest of you, compared to Jack Eo over and over again, what a transformation of action you may get from her. She is, yesterday it was interesting because Ivanka, who has been spoken about as sort of one of, going to be a face of the administration and take on some, possibly take on some first lady duties, she was in a grand and energizing, you know, cascading ruffled Kelly Green dress at Arlington Cemetery. So and Melania was in a sort of a funereal um, raincoat black with the sunglasses. And today she is just an absolute vision with her hair in a bun. So oh. elegant um, with her gloves, um, and she is. Uh, I think she's going to be a picture most of the time. Ralph Lauren, I'm told, but a voice in the ear. There's been controversy, which is bordering on stupidity. Uh, hardly even worth mentioning, but I, <laughs> the, the Ford back and forth. I'm sure those of you are these things. I've seen they, they took the Ford clothing oh, yeah. from the from the Casino yes, the and Las Vegas. And beauty products and sunglasses. Yeah. The purge. Things that matter. Yeah, exactly. Hashtag Instagram. Uh, and George W. Bush, who's been doing very well, and uh, painting down south, and been this quiet about Lord things. Let's look at this. Mayor Tenet, Julie Adams. The House of Representatives, Karen Hobbs. Abigail Blunt. Mrs. Jenna Ryan. The Honorable Elaine El... And Mrs. Julie McCarthy. <laughs> She was born for that moment. Seriously. She is so elegant, and she has the most sort of regal posture. But it is wonderful to think about what it must be for everyone back in Slovenia watching oh. her become the first lady of the United States of America. And there we have it. The outgoing president and vice president. Somebody's ready to get to Palm Springs. <laughs>
I was looking on, you get that sense. on the Fox weather app this morning for Palm Springs. It is not exactly how one would dream it for your, for your vacation. Uh, today, 100% chance of rain and 60 degrees. Tomorrow looks good. And then for the next three days, it's a, it's a rain festival in the high desert. But I guarantee you, he says the, he thing, wants to get some... <laughs> the thing about which he's most excited, he has said repeatedly, is not setting an alarm, not tomorrow, not going to do it as one of his predecessors might have put it. Listen. Wouldn't be prudent. <laughs> the former president, uh, Bush the 41st, I, I should tell you, uh, is in the hospital, has a, a case of pneumonia. They cleared his breathing tube, but I, I'm told by people very close to the family that, that he's doing very well. He's going he's gonna to be just fine, and so is his wife, Barbara, and here's hoping they make it to three or four more inaugurals down the road. What a fantastic family. I'll tell you, I remember uh, 12 years ago, no, 16, was it 16 years ago? Eight years ago, not old. Eight years ago, the former President Bush the 41st came into the, into the media room, if you will, in the White House to tell everybody goodbye in the afternoon after inauguration. And he and his wife came in, gave us all big hugs, remembered stories about our families, thanked us for all we had done for their families. He just is one of the nicest, sweetest men I think I've ever come across. So humble and such a wonderful representative. They sent the nicest note to the Obamas. I have a good excuse. Uh, they say if I come to Washington for the inauguration, it might put me six feet under as the former president. How is that humor? So they're going to stay down in Houston. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, the Honorable Barack H. Obama, and the Vice President Joseph R. Biden, escorted by Senate Democratic Secretary Gary Myrick, Senate Democratic Leader and Rules Committee Ranking Member Charles E. Schumer, and House Democratic Leader Nancy Pelosi. said Barack Obama in his closing interview with 60 Minutes and with others, I believe Lester Holt over on over NBC said the same thing. He's like, you know, this is not what I expected. This is uh, unconventional. It's uh, not something for which we really prepared, but he says, I think we're going to be okay. Even though political differences are enormous, we have best traditions and our set level of checks and balances. Nobody's going to run away with this country. I, I liked hearing it. Right, and I thought he struck a good balance at his last press conference, and there was many laughs. He's really dragging out the goodbyes. But yeah. he basically said he wants to be quiet and stay quiet, but on the issues that are um, urgent, um, that have to do with our democracy uh, and a free press, um, and, and, and some policy issues, he will stand up and speak out, but generally is not going to be the barking voice of the Democratic Party. Bush the 43rd just got, uh, President the 43rd just got a wag of the Obama finger. <laughs> Anyone who's ever gotten that wag, I got that wag once uh, at, a, <laughs> at a State of the Union lunch with the President a few years ago. You're not supposed to take pictures in there, but you know, I wanted to sneak a picture. And I got the presidential wag. I'm like, ooh, I've seen that before. I was a little different Bush the 41st. And you, I think, right, the press conference, he said he was not a, it, it signaled that he wasn't going to be speaking out a lot, but it was also kind of a shot across the bow. Yeah, he said warning. that there were, there were things that he was going to speak out on, you know, outright discrimination, uh, as you point out, uh, you know, attacks on the press, uh, issues that dealt with the core of American democracy. It was quite clear he was going to be uh, vocal. Uh, he, this is a fairly positive person. People close to him say that he's, you know, just naturally positive and optimistic, and so I think that you're hearing some of that come through, but it's a cautious departure as well. Uh, one where he says he's not going to just slip into the uh, into the shadows. Donald Trump with a uh, maybe a, a thoughtful gaze there. Uh, imagine the moment he's about to have. He, he will walk out onto the mall before hundreds of thousands of people with the realization that he is now to to lead this nation and the world. Astounding, uh, and and a man who has who has been in so many enormous moments throughout his life on stage and screen and out before hundreds of thousands for months facing adulation across the nation. Now the transition from 
from uh, campaigning to governing that we are led to believe this morning he got the nuclear codes before the day is over. He'll know all the secrets of the United States, what we can do and what we can't do. And as George Bush put it, one, uh, Bush the 41st put it, the good stuff as well, the good things that America can do around the world. Uh, it'll be a heady day for him. And you wonder if we'll get a tweet or two. I'm sure <laughs> not on matters of... And you, of see, you see him now with some of the people who are going to be so important to make his administration work. Paul Ryan, the relationship that they'll develop over time. Um, that's a really interesting thing to come on that. Kevin McCarthy standing yeah. next to him. You know, this is a man who's not been in the military, who has not had a, a government or a political job. He's never uh, taken an oath. This is, and this is a huge government management job. He's the oldest uh, president to be inaugurated. Uh, but you would never know that from that campaign. You had Ladies older candidates running. Vice President-elect Michael Richard Pence. not shake his hand. They just nodded their head at him to pass him on to keep going. That had to be kind of shitty feeling. has his stern sort of scowl uh, while Pence is smiling. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, escorting the president-elect, the staff director for the Joint Congressional Committee on Inaugural Ceremonies, Stacey McHatton McBride, the Senate Sergeant-at-Arms, Frank Larkin, the House Sergeant-at-Arms, Paul Irving, the Chairman of the Joint Congressional Committee on Inaugural Ceremonies, Roy Blunt, Rules Committee Ranking Member and Senate Democrat Leader Charles E. Schumer, the Speaker of the House of Representatives Paul D. Rand, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy, House Democrat Leader Nancy Pelosi. President-elect of the United States, Donald John Trump.
the chairman of the joint commission ceremonies to be very blunt. Thank you all. If you if you have a seat, you can down. Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President elect, Mr. Vice President elect, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the inauguration of the 45th President of the United States of America. the executive, the judicial branches of our constitutional government come together for the 58th inauguration of the President of the United States. Millions of people all over the world will watch and will listen to this event. 36 years ago at his first inauguration, it was also the first inauguration on the side of the Capitol. President Is both commonplace and miraculous. Like every four years since 1789, when President George Washington took this exact same oath. Miraculous, because we've done it every four years since 1789, and the example it sets for democracies everywhere. Washington believed the inauguration of the second president would be more important than the inauguration of the first. Many people had taken control of government up until then, but few people had ever had control of anyone else. And as important as the first for the power was, many historians believe that the next election was even more important. When in 1801, one group of people, arguably for the first time, ever in history, willingly, if not enthusiastically, gave control of the government to people they believed had a dramatically different view of what the government would, should, and could do. After that election, they actually discovered a law in the Constitution itself, which was by the 12th Amendment. Thomas Jefferson, at that inauguration, beyond the chaos of the election that had just passed, said, we are all Republicans we are all Federalists. After four years of civil war, Lincoln's second inaugural speech defined reason for the continued war when he pointed out that both sides prayed to the same God. He'd earlier written about those fervent prayers that one side must be and both sides may be wrong. But in 1865, he looked to the future and the memorable moment in that speech was with malice toward none and charity for all. In the middle of the Depression, the country was told that the only thing we had to fear was itself. And President Kennedy proceed a country. The great question that day was ask what you can do for your country. So we come to this place again, commonplace and miraculous, and that moment of celebration, but not a, not a celebration of, of victory, a celebration of democracy. And as we begin that celebration, I call on his eminent Bill Colonel Dillon, Reverend Dr. Sam Rodriguez, and Pastor Paula White came to provide readings and the invocation. Prayer of King Solomon from the Book of Wisdom. Let's pray. God, our ancestor and Lord of mercy, who made things, and in providence of dust the creatures produced by you, to govern holiness and righteousness, and to render judgment with integrity of heart, give us wisdom. We are your servants weak and short-lived, lacking in comprehension of judgment and laws. Indeed, though we be perfect among mortals, 
knows if wisdom which comes to be lacking, we count for nothing. Now with you is wisdom. Because your will was there when you made the world. To understand what in your eyes, what is informable with your commands, send her holy heavens from your glorious throne to snatch her, that she may be with us and work with us, that we may grasp what is pleasing to you, for she knows and understands all things, and will guide us prudently to the end. From the Gospel of Matthew, the fifth chapter, God blesses those who are poor, realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. He blesses those who are in heart, who will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. For you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a Instead, a lamp is placed on its stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, that everyone will praise your Heavenly Father respectfully in Jesus' name. We come to you, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, with grateful hearts, Thank you for this great country that you have decreed to your people. We acknowledge we are a blessed nation with the rich history of faith and fortitude. With the future that is filled with confidence, we bring good every gift come to you. And the United States of America is your gift for which we proclaim our gratitude. As a nation, we pray for our president, Donald John Trump, Vice President Michael Richard Pence, and their families. We ask that you bestow upon our president the wisdom necessary for our nation, the grace to fight us, and the strength to stand for what is honorable and right in your sight. In Proverbs 21, that our power is in your hands. Gracious God, reveal into our president the ability to fulfill your will, the confidence to lead us in justice and righteousness. In every generation, you have provided the strength and power to become that blessed nation. Guide us in discernment, Lord, and give us that strength to persevere and thrive. Now bind and heal our wounds and divisions and join our nation to your purpose. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. The psalmist declared, let your favor be upon this one nation under God. Let these United States of America be that beacon of hope to all people and nations under your dominion, a true hope for humankind. Glory to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, the Missouri State University Chorale.
the link. Share the video on Facebook so others will tune in. Well, the Missouri State University crowd practices and performs about two blocks from my home in Springfield, Missouri, so it was easy to find them, and we're pleased they're here. It's also a great opportunity for me to introduce uh, my colleague, uh, the senator from New York, Chuck Schumer. My fellow Americans, we live in a challenging and tumultuously evolving, ever more interconnected world, a rapidly changing economy that benefits too few while leaving too many behind, a fractured media. A politics frequently consumed by rancor, with threats foreign and domestic. In, in such times, a government or institutions and in the can erode. Despite these challenges, I stand here today confident in this great country for one reason you, the American people. We Americans have always been a forward-looking, problem-solving, optimistic, patriotic, and decent people. 
whatever our race, religion, sexual orientation, gender identity, whether we are immigrant or native born, whether we live with disabilities or do not, in wealth or in poverty, we are all exceptional in our commonly held yet fierce devotion to our country and in our willingness to sacrifice our time, energy, and even our lives to making it a more perfect union. Today we celebrate one of democracy's core attributes, the peaceful transfer of power. And every day we stand up for core democratic principles enshrined in the Constitution, the rule of law, equal protection for all under law, the freedom of speech, press, religion, that the things that make America, America. And we can gain strength from reading our history and listening to the voices of average Americans. They always save us in times of strife. One such American was Major Sullivan Ballou. On July 14, 1861, when the North and South were lining up for their first battle, a time when our country was bitterly divided and faith in the future of our country was a nader. Major Ballou, the second Rhode Island Volunteers, penned a letter to his wife, Sarah. It is one of the greatest letters in American history. It shows the strength and courage of the average American. Allow me to read some of his words, which echo through the ages. My very dear Sarah, he wrote, the indications are very strong that we shall move in a few days, perhaps tomorrow. It is necessary that I should fall on the battlefield for my country. I am ready. I have no misgivings about or lack of confidence in the cause in which I am engaged, and my courage does not halt or falter. I know how strong American civilization now leans upon the triumph of the government, and how great a debt we owe to those who went before us through the blood and suffering of the revolution. And I am willing, perfectly willing, to lay down all my joys in this life to help maintain this government and to pay that debt. What up, Tony? Sarah, my love for you is deathless. It seems to bind me to you. With a mighty cable Please share it to your feed, Tony, so other people will break. tune in. And yet, my love of country comes over me like a strong wind and bears me irresistibly on with all these chains to the battlefield. Sullivan Blue gave his life on the battlefield a week later. Sullivan Blue and Cancer to believe in something bigger than us. I'm willing to sacrifice that we stand today in the full blessing of liberty in the greatest country on earth. And that spirit lives on in each of us. Americans have been here for generations, and those who have just died, and I know, our best days. I urge all Americans to read Blue's full letter. His words. Give me solace, strength. I hope they will give you the same. Now, please stand while the Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, Clarence Thomas, is misters the oath of office to the Vice President. after me. I, Michael Richard Pence, do solemnly swear. I, Michael Richard Pence, do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. 
that I will support and defend the Hi, Constitution Anna. of the United States. Please share the video so others will tune in. Enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. And that I will well and faithfully discharge of the office on which I'm about to enter. The duties of the office on which I am about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. God bless you. God bless you. Tabernacle Choir, accompanied by President's own United States Marine Band.
of Unity, John G. Roberts, Jr., will administer the presidential oath of office. Everyone, please stand. <clears throat> Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Donald John Trump, do solemnly swear. I, Donald. That I will make the office president of the United States, president of the United States, and will, to the best of my ability, and will, to the best of my ability, serve, protect, and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. Help me. Help me get out. Oh, what the hell, motherfucker? What a great honor to be able to introduce for the first time ever anywhere the 45th President of the United States of America, Donald J. Trump. If they assassinate now, you deal with Pence. Chief Justice Roberts, President Carter, President Clinton, President Bush, President Obama, fellow Americans, and people of the world, thank you. We, the citizens of America, are now joined in a great national effort to rebuild our country and restore its promise for all of our people. Together we will determine the course of America and the world for many, many years to come. We will face challenges, we will confront hardships, but we will get the job done. Every four years we gather on these steps to carry out the orderly and peaceful transfer of power. And we are grateful to President Obama and First Lady Michelle Obama for their gracious aid throughout this transition. They have been magnificent. Thank you. Thank you. Today's ceremony, however, has very special meaning. Because today, we are not merely transferring power from one administration to another, or from one party to another, but we are transferring power from Washington, D.C., and giving it back to you, the people. You goddamn right. For too long, a small group in our nation's capital has reaped the rewards of government while the people have borne the cost. Washington flourished, but the people did not share in its wealth. 
Politicians prospered, but the jobs left and the factories closed. The establishment protected itself, but not the citizens of our country. Their victories have not been your victories. Their triumphs have not been your triumphs. And while they celebrated in our nation, there was little to celebrate for struggling families all across our land. That all changes starting right here and right now because this moment is your moment. It belongs to you. It belongs to everyone gathered here today and everyone watching all across America. This is your day. This is your celebration. And this the United States of America is your country. What truly matters is not which party controls our government, but whether our government is controlled by the people. January 20th, 2017 will be remembered the as the day the people. the people became the rulers of Thank this nation know. again. The forgotten men and women of our country it. will be forgotten no longer. Everyone is listening to you now. You came by the tens of millions to become part of a historic movement, the likes of which the world has never seen before. At the center of this movement is a conviction that a nation is to serve its citizens. Americans want great schools for their children, safe neighborhood families, and good jobs for themselves. These are just and terrible demands. People and a righteous public. But for too many of our citizens, reality exists. Mothers and children trapped in poverty in our inner cities, rusted out factories, scattered like tombstones across the landscape of our nation. Education system flush with cash, but which leaves our young and beautiful students deprived of all knowledge. And the crime, and the gangs, and the drugs that have stolen poverty. Success. We share one heart, one home, and one glorious destiny. The oath of office is all the importance. For many decades, we've enriched foreign industry at the expense of American industry, subsidized the armies of other countries while allowing for the very completion of our military. We've defended other nations' borders while refusing to defend our own. And spent and trillions of dollars while America's infrastructure has fallen into disrepair and decay. We've made our countries rich 
while the wealth, strength, and confidence of our country has dissipated over the horizon. One by one, the factory shattered and left our shores with not even a thought about the millions and millions of American workers that were left behind. The wealth of our middle class has been ripped from their homes and then redistributed all across the world. But that is the past. And now we are looking only to the future. We assembled here today are issuing a new decree to be heard in every city, in every foreign capital, and in every hall of power. From this day forward, a new vision will govern our land. From this day forward, it's going to be only America first. America first. on trade, on taxes, on our borders from the ravages of other countries, making our products, stealing our companies, and destroying our jobs. Protection will lead to great prosperity and strength. Thanks for tuning in. I will fight for you with every breath in my body. Starlito. I will never share the video ever so others let in. you down. America will start winning again. Winning like never before. We will bring back our jobs. We will people off of welfare and back to work with American hands and American labor. We will follow the rules, high American and higher American. We will seek friendship and goodwill. Of the world. But we do know that the understanding that is the right of all nations to put their own interests first. We do not seek to impose our way of life on anyone, but rather to let it shine as a we will shine for everyone to follow. We will reinforce old alliances and form new ones and unite the civilized world against radical Islamic terrorism which we will eradicate completely from the face of the earth. say those words. At the bedrock of our politics will be a total allegiance to the United States of America. And through our loyalty to our country, we will rediscover our loyalty to each other. When you open your heart to patriotism, there is no room for prejudice. The Bible tells us how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. We must speak our minds openly, debate our disagreements honestly, but always pursue solidarity. When America is united, 
America is totally unstoppable. There should be no fear. We are protected and we will always be protected. We will be protected by the great men and women of our military and law enforcement. And most importantly, we will be protected by God. Finally, we must think big and dream even bigger. In America, we understand that a nation is only living as long as it is striving. We will no longer accept politicians who are all talk and no action, constantly complaining, but never doing anything about it. The time for empty talk is over. Now arrives the hour of action. Do not allow anyone to tell you that it cannot be done. No challenge can match the heart and fight and spirit of America. We will not fail. Our country will thrive and prosper again. We stand at the birth of a little millennium, ready to unlock the mysteries of science, to free the earth from the miseries of disease, and to harness the energies, industries, and technologies of tomorrow. A new national pride will stir our souls, lift our sights, and heal our divisions. It's time to remember that old wisdom our soldiers will never forget, that whether we are black, or brown or white, we all bleed the same red blood of patriots. We all enjoy the same glorious freedoms, and we all salute the same great American flag. destiny and your courage and goodness and love will forever guide us along the way together we will make america strong again we will make america wealthy again we will make america proud again we will make america safe again and yes together we will make america great again thank you god bless you and God bless America. Thank you. God bless America.
time, I call on uh, Rabbi Marvin Heyer, Reverend Franklin Graham, and Bishop Wayne T. Jackson to provide readings and the benediction. You know, God, bless President Donald J. Trump and America, our great nation. God, us remember the words of the psalmist, who may dwell on your holy mountain, and speaks the truth, who knows that when you eat the labor of your hands, you are praiseworthy, that he who sows in tears shall reap in joy because the freedoms we enjoy are not granted in perpetuity but must be reclaimed by each generation as our ancestors have planted for us so we must plant for others while it is not for us to complete the task neither are we free to desist from them dispense justice for the needy and the orphan, for they have no one but their fellow citizens, and because a nation's wealth is measured by her values and not by her vaults. Bless all of our allies around the world who share our beliefs. By the rivers of Babylon, we wept as we remembered Zion, if I forget thee, O Jerusalem, may my right hand fill. The doer of all these shall never falter. May the days come soon when justice will dwell in the wilderness and righteousness will abide in the fertile fields and the work of righteousness will be peace quietness and confidence forever. Amen. Mr. President, in the Bible reign is a sign of God's blessing. And it started to reign President, when you came to the platform. And it's my prayer. God bless you, your family, your administration, and may He bless America. The passage of Scripture comes from 1 Timothy chapter 2. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings, for all those in authority, that we may live peacefully, quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good, and it pleases God, our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, Christ Jesus, who gave them as a ransom for all people. Now to the King Eternal, immortal, invisible, the God and glory for everything I am. Thank you.
President of the United States of America. It happened exactly at high noon. They truncated the schedule just a little bit. And just as the clock struck 12, Donald J. Trump was sworn in as the 45th President of the United States. Now the dignitaries leaving the day, uh, the former President, now former President Barack Obama and his family will very quickly, I'm told, uh, jet off to Palm Springs on their last trip on government dime. Their return trip, we resume to Washington, where they were at home, will be uh, on their own. Uh, now, former President Bill Clinton, the former First Lady Hillary Clinton, former candidate Clinton, on what is uh, 
no doubt, a day of mixed emotions. And a largely, frankly, familiar speech in many ways uh, from the new president, uh, one that reminded so many of us here as we watched in, under the tents, high atop the Chamber of Commerce building just across from this grand American scene, the former president Bush, the 40 crooked bastard. With all bases for, uh, for Bob and Liddy Dole, who were there on the, on the back our Mike Emanuel is up on the Capitol Hill and at, at up the Capitol steps and has been watching an incredible scene. Absolutely shut. And some very touching moments as you see the new president, uh, the former president Barack Obama, the former vice president Joe Biden stopping and greeting former Senator Bob Dole, once a Republican nominee for president, now uh, in, in his aging years and uh, a touching moment of bipartisanship. We saw Hillary Clinton and former President Bill Clinton going up the steps behind me uh, just in that direction and being greeted by Republicans and Democrats. And so uh, you see some folks, some leader types from over the years who have taken the approach clearly that this is much bigger than being about one man. This is about this great country of ours and peaceful transfer of power to a new administration. So the visuals are quite powerful. Uh, obviously More crooked people. Heard Senator Chuck Schumer speaking, and uh, the Trump supporters did not love everything they heard. We heard some boos when the new president was taking the oath. We heard some boos and some jeering, and so uh, some some signs, some hangover, if you will, from a very very difficult presidential campaign, Chef. Certainly, there was an an, an alternate oath being. Booze from, from stupid people. I don't even want to say stupid. I keep trying to use the word ignorant. They just don't know things. So you can't, you can't get mad at people, really. We can't get mad at people for booing at an event like this when they're not fully informed. If they would have been given all, all the information... They would be on the side that won. People just didn't this. And she made sure to realize that this man is actually the force to be able to control our country, not the people of power in the government. They are not supposed to run the country. They are just supposed to do what we can. And it's in switch. Things have changed over time. And now we need to get back to the basics of America, what it stands for, and patriots, and stand up for ourselves, and, and let the country know, you know, let the government know that we are the ones that need to run this place. It is our place to run, not theirs. Michelle, the board, uh, what happened in the past, known as Marine One, but with, now that the transfer of power, the peaceful transfer of power has taken place, it will be known as Executive One, as the President and First Lady make their way one last time, a flight over the city, they will circle monuments behind us where they will meet their daughters and uh, head out to Palm Springs. Shepard? Jennifer, thanks very much. We don't expect to hear anything from the former president there, do we? It would be a tradition, certainly. It's hard to hear you, Shepard. Um, you were talking about plans that the president and the first lady had, and it's not the first time that the president has gone out to Palm Springs, as we've talked about before. Uh, president Ford uh, went out to Palm Springs when he left office. And so the president, first lady, will be out there. Their their uh, daughter, who is a tenth grader here at Sidwell Open School, she will be back in school soon, and they will be moving back to into a house in Calarama, a neighborhood here in Washington D.C. And un it's unusual for a president to remain in Washington, uh, but because their daughter is still a tenth grader, they want to allow her to finish high school. And of course, their daughter Malia has had a year off, and she uh, will be heading to Harvard next year. Shepard. Jennifer, thanks so much. We'll go back as the former president, uh, President Obama, is expected to greet his staff there at Joint Base Andrew, Andrews before flying off with the family. Let's bring in our panel, A.B. Stoddard, associate editor at RealClearPolitics.com. John Bussey is the associate editor for the Wall Street Journal. Julie Bikowitz, the national political reporter for the Associated Press. Thoughts? Well, uh, Chef, I had the privilege of being uh, right where Jennifer was standing as the former in 2009, along with one camera on the east front when um, President Clinton and Hillary Clinton departed, uh, came down the steps 
And I was quite taken aback at the time of what a dramatic moment it is when they have just for 20 minutes no longer been president and first lady or less than, and they literally lift off in a helicopter above the Capitol grounds um, as a new administration begins. And it, it is quite a visual, and they have to walk down the stairs with their shaky legs of emotion, and it's, it's really an incredible um, thing. It will be more emotional when they get to join Air Force Base Andrews, and then they get on a, a real airplane to California, and they, as you said, be saying goodbye to people, but they want to sort of make this as quick as possible, but it is the final goodbye in officialdom. Um, all those people you saw them saying hi to former presidents, former senators, former vice presidents, and it is just uh, an incredible quiet moment here on the East Front when that former, newly former president lifts off the ground with his wife. And the current president, the new president, escorting the for former president, as is tradition through the Capitol, uh, John Bussey, quite a vision. It is. Uh, and that was quite a speech. Uh, that was something that was reminiscent of the convention, the Republican convention, this kind of painting of America, this, this dystopian America, uh, what do you refer to as the, this American carnage, uh, deprived of all knowledge in the public. Uh, not as you said, Donald Trump has given. I mean, there's a fairly familiar term. All these speeches are used uh, in part to uh, praise the work of the previous president and to fall uh, all together. As the person said, we're not, uh, you know, we're not separate. We're all federalists and, and, and Republicans. There's not very much of that in the case. Uh, it was a criticism of the establishment as to the government back to the people. And the establishment. Was on that with him. Um, as he as he kind of went through his limit, I think also to note this decree of you know t uh, as, he, as he put it to you know far and wide, not just Americans but uh, uh, people abroad. That from now on, there's a new vision in America, and it's going to be it's going to be only America first. Uh, that is an inaugural speech, and it'll be something that our allies uh, in Asia and Europe uh, will be uh, taking note of. into the barrier.
Google. State in Washington, with short driveway. Uh, if protocol holds and the schedule is as it announced, they will drive him into the station. There it is. <laughs> and that's very train that he'll be taking. Joe Biden and his wife, Dr. Joe Biden, uh, will sell up to Delaware, as so many of us will, for the next couple of days. And the first family, former first family, and now Landscape and Jennifer Griffin was there. Jennifer, 
Shepard, it was, um, you could see the emotion on Michelle Obama's face from the time that she arrived at the Capitol. We know from past experience uh, and from past presidents and Hanvers presidencies that they spent the morning at the residence uh, meeting with about a hundred members of the staff inside the uh, the state dining room. That is always a very emotional moment uh, because the staff hands to the first lady the American flag that was flown over the Capitol on the day that they were inaugurated back in 2009 and the flag that was flown today. So they are given that as a gift before they leave the White House. But you could tell when Michelle Obama arrived here at the Capitol that uh, it, it looked as though she had been crying earlier in the day. Um, not surprising, given, given the weight of the ceremony that they were about to witness and participate in. Eight years is a very long time, and it was notable that the Obama daughters were not here at the Capitol today. I think, and this is just a speculation, but uh, the president gets very emotional in talking about his daughters and seeing his daughters. And I think you saw the faces of not just the Obamas, but also the Bidens, that they really were trying to hold it together for this ceremony, which is so grand and so august and so much. Washington, if you have been here, the noise of choppers and sirens and jets is ubiquitous uh, and unending, it, it seems, and clearly they've obviously cleared the airspace for, for this event. There's, there are no trailing jets, there are no trailing helicopters, there's no security details, no Marine One. This is what executive one for the last, last time. She met with some loving staff. And right? she's an innocent. It's her daughter's residence. All the bombs saying he's not a weeper. But um, you can tell he's in his many, many, many goodbyes. Uh, he's been loath to, to, to see this end. They were very, very hard to have the, and they talked about it open. Normal for their Joe Biden uh, and Dr. Jill Biden arriving at the station. It's a very quick car ride over there. Especially sure. they roll. <laughs> sure, and they go right into the station. And he's such a big fan of uh, public transportation, and in particular Amtrak. I often joke that he's their greatest spokesman, uh, unpaid spokesman.
together to make America first again. Uh, he's, he's got a big challenge and was very much a populist uh, theme uh, and I think to a certain extent it's, it's do you think in terms that this is the 58th time this has happened uh, and I, I the inaugural uh, 45 men have been elected president or served president uh, uh, she makes you she proud there's no uh, man of mock there at the end uh, and a plane. it's a very ambitious speech that he laid out there's a lot of things that he has promised to do Obviously, the, the challenge is great, and it's going to be just where we are, but it, it's a very special day, and as America, I'll be very, very proud of it. All the details of the speech, anything surprising to you, what were they? Uh, I think the key thing here, again, it was about we, uh, a lot of promises, uh, which he's made to his campaign, uh, a very ambitious agenda to make these changes that we do. Uh, he's now going to have a different responsibility as a leader of the country. That has a big role in all this. And we sometimes forget until you see a session like this. This is, this, this is the Congress of show. This is on their turf. Uh, uh, we have an equal government. Uh, uh, obviously, the president is a very, very powerful position. But, but the money and the control and the Absolutely. And it's a it's a small to know because he's our first major president that we have, but as he was in the oh, his uh, actual POTUS Twitter handle went live, there haven't been any tweets from that and of course the the previous uh, POTUS user that is all archived into a
part of the system. What is the new part of the A car was to Monkey Street and maybe you were a case on 13th and uh, Franklin Park protesters tore to car there 13th and they throw bars and were vandalizing property damage there, some windows broken. So there have been demonstrations, counter demonstrations, many 60 groups were expected to be here. Uh, but it felt like he paused a bit to listen to the inauguration speech, as did Paul Orzelak. He's a speechwriter for President Clinton and the senior domestic policy. Also, we're having partners from the firm West Wing Writers. Your thoughts on the speech today? I'll tell you, there's no day like this anywhere on the planet, and it is, as Ed said, a remarkable day. Just to watch the unifier. The question coming in today is a unifier, and in a sense, he was a unifier today. There were unified protests across 50 states and 32 countries, and that's another sacred constitutional right that didn't didn't exist really in the world before America came along. The right to peaceably protest government. So, 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 so,
that there has been changes in America over the last eight years. Not only can look at social media, but uh, uh, there's more inclusion as a national effort. It's easier to have a more inclusive watching it's been OC you've been watching the nation of Donald Trump the 45th president of the United States thank you so much for watching everyone let's check out the YouTube channel you should sue all together the number two no spaces